Well, good morning. It's so great to be here with you this morning, and if we could, let's, let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for the many blessings that we have, and God, we just ask this morning that you would be present with us, that you would open our eyes, that you would soften our hearts, and that, Lord, you would give us that wisdom to recognize the truth of who you are the truth of your word, and that, God, you would give us the boldness and the courage to proclaim your truth and your gospel and be the light of Jesus Christ that you've called us to be. Above all, Lord, we give this day to you, and we ask that everything that we do and say would serve to glorify you and bring honor to you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is so great to be here. By the way, just a quick show of hands. How many of you were here last night? Okay, a bunch of you. Good. So I don't have to repeat all the stuff from last night. That's great. Uh, you know, it occurs to me, I, I was telling the folks last night, that my radio show doesn't make it uh, out here to this part of, uh, of Canada. And so my show is it's played throughout... Uh, big parts of Michigan and, and around the country, and and I'm on from noon till four, Monday through Friday, and and I come here and I realize that you folks are thinking, who is this guest speaker? We have some Yahoo that we don't even know who he is, and so I thought what I would do to kind of start this morning's discussion with you is just share with you a little bit about myself, uh, and then we're going to talk about the existence of God, but uh, what I... Uh, what I am, I'm a, a Christian apologist. Now, that doesn't mean that I apologize for my faith. Apologist comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a logical, rational, evidence-based argument for a belief system. And I've always been a logical, left-brain, analytical thinker, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to the practice of apologetics, because I want people to see that our faith in Christ is actually logical. I mean, it really is. Now, I want everybody to understand, our faith as Christians is not dependent upon logic, but it's backed up by logic, by science, by history, by archaeology, by intellectual reasoning. And that's what my passion is to let people see this. I was saved when I was 19 years old. I accepted the Lord at an altar call in Columbus, Ohio, in the United States. And as I told the audience last night, early on in my faith, I had some doubts. I had some tough questions. And I didn't really know if what we believed as Christians was really true. Because as I, as I talked to people back then, I remember thinking to myself, wait a minute, let's look at this logically. I know that Christians are convinced that Jesus is the truth, but Buddhists are just as convinced that they're right, and Hindus are just as convinced that they're right, and Muslims are just as convinced that they're right. And so how do I know what we believe is actually really true and not just the religion of Western society. And so this is what got me into apologetics. I started studying. I started researching. I started researching all the different religions of the world. I started researching Christianity, the manuscript evidence, the non-biblical evidence, ancient Roman history. And you know something? The more that I scrutinized Christianity, the more I dissected it, the stronger my faith in Jesus Christ became. And you know what I learned? I learned that every other religion in the world is nothing more than a philosophy that was started by some regular human being like Buddha or Muhammad or Krishna or Confucius. These were regular human beings who lived, who died, who stayed dead. And they convinced other people of their philosophy and that grew, but at the end of the day, these were regular human beings. They had no power to do the things that Jesus Christ did. 
They could not walk on water. They could not change the weather. They could not make blind people see. They could not make paralyzed people walk. They could not raise people from the dead. And when they died themselves, they stayed in the grave and their bodies rotted. Jesus Christ is the only truth. He really is. We are saved by him and him alone. He is the only one who is capable of actually forgiving us of our sins. No other human being on planet earth who started a religion hundreds or thousands of years ago, none of them have the power and the authority from heaven to forgive sins. Only God can forgive our sins. And this is done through Jesus Christ. And this is what I learned. The, the more I researched, I was like, wow, this is really true. We really do have the only truth. Well, anyway, my, so my faith got stronger. And I started moving into the world of apologetics and started researching all of the evidences for what we believe as Christians and finding out, is it really true? And what's the evidence to back this up? Along the way, my wife and I, uh, we have, we've been married 35 years now. We have seven children. We've had seven children now, one daughter and then six boys after her. So this is, uh, this is kind of a male-heavy family, needless to say. But one of the things that I have really loved in my walk with the Lord is seeing that God is willing to give us the evidence to prove that his word is true. And so we're going to talk this morning specifically about the existence of God. Now, I know we all believe God exists. I understand that. But we talk to a lot of people who don't. And there's a growing number of people in culture and society that don't necessarily believe that there's really a God. And this movement of atheism seems to be growing more and more and more. And that's one of the reasons why I have these kind of debates on my show as I do. Now, as, as an apologist, I spend a lot of time debating people. And there's a lot of different debates that I enjoy having. I've debated Planned Parenthood on the issue of abortion. I've debated Mormons and Jehovah's Witness and uh, all, all kinds of different uh, groups like that. I've debated a lot of evolutionary scientists. I love debating evolution. By the way, I'll tell you right now, biblical creation really is true. The book of Genesis really is true. The earth is not 4.6 billion years old. The universe is not 3.8 billion years old. As a matter of fact, the days of creation were six literal 24-hour days. This happened about 6,000 years ago. There was a worldwide flood about 4,500 years ago. Noah's Ark is real. The animals were on the ark. Dinosaurs did not go extinct 65 million years ago. They were created on days five and day six of creation. Yes, dinosaurs went on Noah's Ark. I know that sounds crazy to some of you, but believe it or not, that's a lot easier to prove than you might think. And then gradually over the last 4,500 years, dinosaurs slowly went extinct until the last few remnants of dinosaurs didn't finally go extinct until just a few hundred years ago. Everything that I just now told you sounds crazy to some people, but I guarantee you the scientific and archaeological and historic evidence documents and verifies what I'm telling you is true. The problem is it's been censored. The evidence has been censored from school science books, from school history books. But if you honestly, I could spend all afternoon doing nothing but giving you evidence after evidence after evidence to prove that these things are true. And you'll be like, wow, really? I never heard of that before. But it's all public information. You can look it up yourself. Uh, I've just done all the research for you. And so that's what I do as an apologist. But one of the groups of people that I've always enjoyed debating on my show are the atheists. And I've had a lot of debates with some of the biggest name atheists in the world. Uh, people like Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens, A.C. Grayling, Dan Barker, Daniel Dennett, American atheists, Michael Shermer, 
As a matter of fact, uh, Victor Stanger, Victor Stanger, the atheist astrophysicist, him and I spent close to an hour debating the conservation of energy law and the first law of thermodynamics as it relates to cosmology uh, and him trying to prove that there's no God. So I love getting into these discussions. And what I want to do this morning with you is basically give you a logical, rational, scientific reason for believing that God is real and that God is true. I know we believe it by faith. I know we can read it in Scripture and in His Word. That's great. And I, I, I support that. But we're going to get in conversations with friends and family and coworkers, and they want to see if we have some kind of logical explanation for God's existence, and especially the younger generation growing up. So let's talk about some of this if we could. The first thing I want to establish is even the, the issue of proof. I mean, what does it mean to prove something? Technically, if I'm really to be logical about this, technically, I can't prove to you, prove that God exists. I can't make God appear right here, three-dimensionally in front of you. So what does that mean? Because also, technically, I can't even really prove to you that the moon exists. You can look up at the sky at night and you can see it, but I can't prove to you that that's not just a mirage. I can't prove to you that wind even exists. Technically, I can't prove that. You say, well, but Bob, I can see the leaves all blowing in this direction, and I can see all the tree branches going down that way, and I can see the flag waving like this. Yeah, but you don't see the wind. So technically, I can't prove to you that wind is what's making that, those leaves go. I can't prove to you that wind is what's making the flag do that. But is it logical for me to deny the existence of wind? Is it logical for me to say there must be some other cause that's making the flag do that and the trees all bend that way and the leaves blow in that direction? It's got to be something other than wind. That would be illogical. And in the same way, technically, I can't prove to you that God exists. But what I can do is I can examine some laws of physics. I can examine mathematics I can look at this logically and scientifically, and then we can determine what is the most logical thing to believe. And so that's the way I want to approach the existence of God. To do this, one of the things that, that we will often hear from the atheists is they'll bring up the problem of evil. So let's deal with that right away. Well, if there's a God, how do you explain all the evil in the world? Look at all the pain and the suffering and the murder and the death and, and, and terrorism and all of these horrible, horrible, evil things. If you believe in God, how do you explain evil? Well, first let me say that when people talk about the evil and the bad that happens in the world, that's not an argument for God's non-existence. That's an argument to try to claim that God is a bad God. So if somebody brings up all the bad things that happens in the world, oh, how could a good God allow this? Or how, how come, if there's a God, then why does this happen? Why does this happen? You just say to them, wait a minute, are you trying to tell me that there's no God? Or are you trying to tell me that you think that God exists, but he's a bad God? Because if there's no God, it's irrelevant to talk about the, the evil in the world. I mean, look, when I was growing up, when I was younger, I had a stepfather who was very abusive, Okay, I mean, he would beat us, and he, would, he was a pretty abusive guy. So I can tell you all the bad things about him, but that's not an argument to say he didn't exist. Now, God is not an abusive God. God is a loving God. But there are some atheists who perceive God to be a bad and abusive God. Okay, fine. That's where I'll say to the atheist, if you want to admit that God exists then fine, admit that he exists, and then let's move on to a discussion of whether God is a good God or a bad God. So you agree with me that God exists, you just don't think he's good. And see what they say. They're going to go, well, no, he doesn't exist. 
then I'm going to say, then why are you bringing up whether you think he's good or not if you don't think he exists in the first place? So the other point I want to bring up, when someone brings up the problem of evil, the way that this is presented is that this is somehow our problem as Christians. You have to explain the problem of evil. If you believe in God, how do you explain the evil in the world? No, I'm going to turn this around. It's the atheist who has to explain the problem of evil, and I'll tell you why. And again, I want you to just think left brain logical for a moment, okay? If there is no God, if there is no God, then that means that in the entire universe, we are nothing more than evolving blobs of carbon-based tissue. That's all we are. That means there is no universal standard for right and wrong. There is no universal standard for good and evil. If there is no God, what is evil? How do you even define evil if there's no God? Well, because I consider it evil. What, because most humans on planet Earth consider murdering babies evil? Which, by the way, I do too. But who says? Because what if some other aliens, what if the Vulcans in the Gamma Quadrant somewhere, what if they believe that it's not evil? As a matter of fact, today, right now, there are all kinds of people in politics and in our culture around us that believe that abortion is a good thing. They don't think it's evil. So who says it's evil? If there's no God, who says it's evil? Is it evil when a man takes a child and kills that child? Of course, we consider that evil. Even atheists would consider that evil. However, is it also evil when a lion attacks a baby gazelle and kills that gazelle and eats it? Did an evil thing happen there? The atheists will say no. Well, why? Because we're nothing more than humans, animals. We're just all evolved blobs of tissue. Why is it evil for humans to do what the lion did to the gazelle, but it's not evil for the lion to have done it? If there's no God, there's no point of reference. There's no standard by which to say this is right and this is wrong. Everything is acceptable because in the no God scenario, we're just evolving blobs of tissue. So if an atheist says to me, how do you explain the problem of evil? I'm going to say, how do you explain the problem of evil? How do you even define evil? What is your point of reference? Who says what is evil? Most humans on earth? Well, big deal. We could all be wrong because there is no absolute right or wrong in an atheist worldview. But what I want to move to next is some straight science. Let's just talk about science. You know, it drives me crazy when, when atheists will say that as Christians, we don't believe in science. You know, do you believe in the Bible or do you believe in science? It's like, oh, stop it. Who do you think created science? Right? God created science. Well, but science says, hold on a second. First of all, science doesn't say anything. Science is not an entity with a free will that can say things. Science is nothing more than a method. It's a methodology that human beings use and we draw conclusions, we form opinions, we form hypotheses based on scientific principles. But I submit to you that the laws of science prove that there has to be a God. It is not possible for the atheistic worldview to exist. And I want to explain why, okay? To start with, I want to explain, and, and by the way, for those of you, I know my show doesn't come here, so you don't get to listen to my show. So one of the things I want to explain to you how I, how I do apologetics, okay? I do apologetics differently than most people do. I do what's called apologetics made simple, all right? My thing is to take complicated issues and translate them into simple fifth grade language. That's the way that I do my show. That's the way I do my apologetics. So I try to take really complicated things and translate it into everyday layman's terms. And so that's what I'm going to try to do this morning with you regarding science. 
So the first place I want to start scientifically is something called the conservation of energy law within the first law of thermodynamics. Now, some of you listen to that and you're like, okay, you're going to simplify that for me? Well, I'm going to try, <laughs> okay? Uh, within the first law of thermodynamics, and I want to make sure we're clear, the laws of thermodynamics are scientific laws. They're recognized laws. Just like the law of gravity is a recognized law. It exists. Gravity has been proven, tested, retested, and we now know scientifically that gravity is in fact a law. You can know if I take this and I drop it, it's going to fall. It's not going to float. We know it's going to fall 100% of the time unless God steps in and performs a miracle and he could make it float if he wanted to. But he's usually not going to. He usually will just let the natural laws of physics take effect. So these are scientifically proven. Well, the first law of thermodynamics is a scientifically proven law. And here's what it is. It states that energy must be conserved. Energy must be conserved. What does that mean? What that means is this. Energy can be converted into different types and forms of energy. Energy can also be converted into matter, stuff like this. Matter can be converted back into energy. But here's what the law of conservation says. However much total stuff there is, however much matter, however much energy, however much there is, that must be conserved. In other words, it has to stay the same amount. You cannot increase the total amount of energy and matter. You cannot decrease the total amount of energy and matter. All you can do is get them to convert into different forms of each other, but the total amount has to stay the same. Everybody follow me so far? I hope so. What that means is this, however much stuff there is in the universe, there had to, according to the first law of thermodynamics, there had to always be that much stuff. Never more, never less. Scientifically, it's impossible that you could have had more or less stuff that exists in the universe. If you think of it this way, you can't, th this, this podium is made of wood. I cannot cause this to cease to exist. It must always exist. You say, well, but Bob, we could run it through a grinder and we can, discern, we, we can render it to dust. Okay, but all of those dust particles and the molecules that make this up still exist. You can't cause them not to exist. We can burn this. We can put it on fire, okay? And you can see the smoke and the ashes. But it still exists in the smoke, the ashes, and converted to the heat that is now energy. But the bottom line, it must exist in some form. This is a scientific law. Any atheist scientist will admit this to you. So now let's get to the creation of the universe. We look all around us and we see trillions of stars and galaxies and planets. The universe is filled with all kind of matter and energy. Very simple question, how did it get here? I mean, you think about it, okay? A child can ask a powerful question that an atheist really cannot answer. And that is, how did all the stuff get here? Where did it come from? What the atheist will tell us is that it all started at the Big Bang. And they'll say that if they look at the universe and they see, well, the universe is expanding. And here's the speed with which we think it's expanding. So let's run the clock backwards in time. And we say that 13.8 billion years ago, it would have all been scrunched down to some tiny little dot. It all started with a little dot, some even say a microscopic dot, that exploded into everything that we have right now. And that's one of the reasons they say 13.8 billion years is because they look at the speed with which the universe is expanding and they say, well, let's go at that same speed in reverse and we say it'll take 13.8 billion years for it to go back to the beginning. When actually the truth is, it didn't. The universe was created about 6,000 years ago. The evidences in the universe 
make this clear. There are so many things all throughout the universe from spiral galaxies to short-term comets to even the planets themselves. Do you know that NASA sent out their New Horizons spacecraft uh, several decades ago, actually, and it just three years ago passed the planet Pluto, which they're saying is not a planet now, but they're going to make it a planet again. But when it passed Pluto, you know, something interesting they noticed. Pluto, when you look at our solar system, we have the sun, and then you have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then Pluto. Pluto is this tiny little planet that's the farthest away from the sun, which means that Pluto would have been the first of our planets to freeze solid. If our solar system is 5 billion years old, Pluto should have frozen solid about 4.9 billion years ago. It's the smallest and it's the farthest away from the sun. Yet the New Horizons spacecraft from NASA flew past Pluto, you may recall, in 2015, it was four years ago. Look at the images and look what NASA themselves said about Pluto. They were shocked. They couldn't believe it. Pluto was still hot and warm and active as a planet. You can see the, 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 the planet Pluto itself still has active volcanoes. It's still hot in the center. And NASA was like, wait a minute, how can that be? And they're trying to come up with all kinds of excuses to explain how Pluto could still be hot and young and active. Now, for me, that's not difficult at all. Okay, Pluto is not billions of years old. Pluto is about 6,000 years old, just like the rest of the planets are in our solar system and just like the universe is. By the way, the magnetic fields of planets and moons, those decay and they completely decay and are gone in just a few thousand years. Yet Earth, we still have our magnetic field. The planets still have their magnetic fields. I mean, there's just so many things in the universe that point to it only being a few thousand years old. And I should say on a side note, sometimes people get confused when you see starlight. It's like, well, yeah, but I can see starlight from a star that's a billion light years away. So how could that light get to us in 6,000 years? I, I, if, if we were talking this morning about cosmology, I would love to get into that with you. Okay, I, I explained them in my materials. I've explained it on my show many times. But I want you to understand there are many, many scientifically valid and plausible explanations for how light can travel one billion light years, but in only 6,000 years. I don't have time to explain them all this morning, but trust me, they are consistent with Einstein's theory of relativity, things like gravitational time dilation and other means by which light can actually get here that quickly. So you don't have to assume it took billions of years for the light to get here. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Okay, uh, And afterward, if you want to come out and ask me questions about that, I'll be happy to answer those questions for you. But I want to get back now to the creation of the universe and the belief in a Big Bang. The evolutionists say that everything started with this Big Bang explosion, but the whole universe was in this tiny little dot, and this tiny little dot exploded into everything. You want to know why they say everything started as a tiny little dot? I'll tell you why. Because if an atheist tries to tell you that we went in the universe from nothing to everything, people are going to go, that's too hard to believe. But if they tell you the universe went from nothing to just a little speck, that doesn't seem like that much of a leap. And so people are willing to believe that. But here's the problem. That little speck according to the Big Bang Theory, that little speck still includes everything in the universe. In other words, if I take 10 Nerf balls, and we'll say these Nerf balls represent planets and stars and solar systems, if I take 10 Nerf balls and I squeeze them all together to about the size of one Nerf ball, I still have 10 Nerf balls in there, right? If I squeeze it a little bit harder down to the size of a golf ball, I still have 10 Nerf balls in there. If I get Arnold Schwarzenegger to squeeze it all the way down to the size of a tiny little speck, would you all agree I still have 10 Nerf balls in there? 
So it doesn't matter if they explode starting from a little speck. Every star, every galaxy, every solar system would still be in that little speck. It would just be highly dense. So what the evolutionist, what the atheist wants us to believe is that we went from nothing to everything. So I want them to explain to me how did matter and energy come into existence from nothing? Because that's not possible according to the first law of thermodynamics. It is scientifically impossible. The no God scenario says that nothing has to stay nothing. Now some of you might say, well, maybe the universe always existed. We'll get to that in just a moment. But for right now, I want to make sure that we're clear. It is scientifically impossible to go from nothing to anything, let alone nothing to everything. So when the atheist says, you know, prove to me that there's a God, I'm not going to say to them, well, prove to me there's no God. Instead, what I'm going to say is prove to me that in your no God scenario, you can go from nothing to something. Prove that to me scientifically. They can't. There's only one possibility, and that is that there must be some type of a being, we call him God, who exists that has the power to make something out of nothing, that has the power to create the laws of physics in the first place. Now, sometimes people will say, Okay, well then fine, who made God? Because wouldn't God have had to have a creator? No, God does not need a creator. You want to know why? He created the laws of physics. He doesn't have to obey them. The first law of thermodynamics is not bigger than God. God is the one who created it. So God doesn't have to obey it. Look, God created gravity. But Jesus walked on water. Jesus didn't have to obey gravity if he didn't want to because he created it. Just like God doesn't have to have a beginning. God doesn't have to have had a creator. He always existed for all time, for all of eternity. But he created these laws of physics. And now we on this earth have to obey these laws of physics. But God doesn't. So no one created God. So then, here's what the atheist will say in response. Okay, we can't go from nothing to something. So therefore, I say the entire universe has always existed. And here's what the argument is that they'll, they'll pretty much give, that, that maybe the universe expands and then it hits a certain point and then it contracts again and it closes in on itself and then it explodes again and expands and it's just, but it's always existed. Well, that's scientifically impossible thanks to something called the second law of thermodynamics. Now let me explain the second law of thermodynamics to you. The second law is a heat transfer law. It basically states that heat will transfer toward a colder body to a state of equilibrium. And I know that sounds off scientific, but let me, let me simplify that now in, in everyday language. If I take two cups and I put him here in a room, and one cup has hot coffee in it, and you can see the steam coming off the coffee. The other cup has ice water in it, and you can feel, ooh, that's cold. And I put those two cups in a room, and I walk out of the room. Eventually, what's going to happen to the temperature of these two liquids? We all know, right? They are eventually going to become the same temperature. They will eventually become the same temperature as their surroundings. Everybody follow me on that? Okay. That's the second law of thermodynamics at work. Heat is transferring toward a colder body, toward a state of equilibrium. In other words, they're all going to take on the heat, if you will, of their surroundings. They're going to continue losing heat until they become the average temperature of the room. So if I walk into a room and I see that hot coffee, and I see that cold water, and I see that the coffee is still hotter than the water, I don't know how long they've been in this room. But scientifically, it's impossible that they've been in the room forever. Everybody get that? 
That's not possible scientifically. For the atheist to claim that maybe the universe always existed for all of eternity, scientifically that's impossible. You want to know why? We have heat disparity in the universe. Hot things like stars, balls of fire are still hot. Cold things like comets and ice are still cold. The cold things are still cold. The hot things are still hot. However long you want to believe the universe has been around, it's scientifically impossible that it's been around forever. You can't have that. Now, sometimes the atheist will say, well, but maybe there's parallel universes. So maybe there's other universes that are feeding our universe. Okay, fine. Where do the parallel universes come from? Well, the, the, they, they were fed by other universes. Okay, but eventually you have to work back to the first universe. If you want to believe there's parallel universes, where did the first one come from? How do we go from nothing to something? And then they say, well, there's an infinite number of parallel universes. Okay, if there's an infinite number, you're saying they infinitely existed. If they infinitely exist, existed, then the second law of thermodynamics has to cause all of them to have heat death. So you can't, eventually the universes that would be feeding our universe, they would have to go cold too. They would have to lose all energy too. So every single scenario that the atheist presents is scientifically impossible. And I know I've debated these atheistic scientists. I've debated the Big Bang with these astrophysicists before. And so here's pretty much what they cling to. They say, and I know because I, I debate them, and here's the answer that they give, okay? They say, well, we don't understand everything scientifically. Someday we may discover scientifically the explanation for this. I mean, mankind thought the earth was flat at one time, and we now, we, we learn scientifically that it was not. Uh, one, at one time we believed that the sun revolved around the earth, but we grew scientifically and we learned that that wasn't the case. And so now we'll just eventually someday learn some new scientific laws that will allow nothing to turn into something. Christopher Hitchens, I don't know how many of you remember uh, Christopher Hitchens. The, uh, he died a few years ago, but he was the British famous atheist who wrote the best-selling book, God is Not Great, and he promoted atheism around the world. And I debated Christopher Hitchens on this, and I said, you know, you're practicing faith. And he said, oh, that's absurd. I said, no, no, it's not absurd. You're practicing faith. Let me explain. I believe by faith that Jesus Christ is going to return and prove you all wrong someday. I believe by faith in some event that's going to happen in the future that will prove my point. You are telling me that you believe by faith that some scientists in the future are going to make some special discovery that explains how we went from nothing to something. That hasn't happened. No scientist has done this. There's no theory that can explain this. So you believe by faith that someday something's going to be discovered that will make this possible. How is that not faith? I believe someday Jesus is going to return. You believe by faith that some new scientific discovery is going to be made. We both have faith. The difference is my faith is consistent on the known laws of physics. Your faith is based on some new different laws of physics that you're hoping gets discovered someday. And you say that we're the ones who aren't logical and don't use our brains and don't believe in science? I'm the one who's believing in science. I'm saying, let's, let's go by what science right now has determined to be true. The laws of physics. I'm using today's laws of physics you're hoping by faith that maybe there's a different law of physics somewhere, we just haven't discovered it. Maybe right before the Big Bang, there were different laws of physics at play. There's no evidence for this. So scientifically, it's just not possible in the no-God scenario. Now, the atheist will sometimes say, well, then show him to me. Unless you can show me God, unless you can put him in front of me, unless you can put him in a laboratory, I refuse to believe. 
Let me tell you why that argument is illogical. Remember those two cups that I had before with the liquid in them? Let's say that they're styrofoam cups. Let's say they're styrofoam cups and I turn them upside down. They're empty now. I turn them upside down and I put a golf ball inside one of those styrofoam cups. And I spin them around and you don't know which one has the golf ball in it. But you know the golf ball is at least under one of them. Just like we know matter and energy exists. We see each other. We're here. We know this stuff is here. So we know one of these two cups has a golf ball under it. And I tell you, I'm not going to show you the golf ball. Can I prove to you which cup the golf ball is under without showing you the golf ball? Is it possible for me to prove that to you without presenting the golf ball? It is. You want to know how? All I have to do is take one of these two cups and with my finger, with my hand, smash the cup totally flat. That's all I got to do, smash it totally flat. The laws of physics say it's impossible for me to do that with a golf ball. So by doing this, you can now see the golf ball is not under here. Haven't I proven to you? Since we know it has to be in one of these two. Haven't I proven to you it's in the other one? And I didn't have to show you the golf ball to prove it. All I did was prove to you it cannot be in the other cup. In the same way you prove God exists, you can prove he exists without making him materialize before you. All you have to do is show how every other option scientifically is impossible. That moves me to the next area of discussion, and that's complexity and design. The atheist would have us believe that the Big Bang Theory caused this massive explosion, and then somehow everything in the universe developed a sense of complexity, design, and order. There is no such thing in the real world of complexity, design, and order developing from an explosion. You've all heard the, the cliches, right? A tornado has never gone through a junkyard and produced a 747, right? It doesn't happen ever. You cannot produce complexity, design, and order from chaos. But this is what the atheist believes by faith. I want you to think of this another logical way for a moment. If we're walking down a beach and we see a sandcastle on the beach, a beautiful, intricate sandcastle designed in everything, and we look around for who made the sandcastle and we can't find them anywhere. There's nobody else on the beach for miles. And we're having a debate. How did that sandcastle get there? Which is more logical? To say that someone made the sandcastle or to believe that the sandcastle somehow made itself by the wind and the waves and the sand interacting to coincidentally form the complexity and the design of that sandcastle. Because technically I can't prove somebody made it because I can't show you the person who made it. Is it logical for the atheist to fold his arms and say, well, unless you can show me who made that sandcastle, I say it made itself. Do you see how illogical that is? Put another way, if I walk into a room and I see a painting, a freshly painted painting of, we'll say, a person, like, kind of like the Mona Lisa or something like that, and I walk in that room and I see that there's a palette of paint, there's some paint brushes, and there's a human being, and there's a monkey in the room. And I have a choice, and I know that one of those two painted that painting. I can't prove the human painted the painting. Is it logical for me to believe it was the monkey? How about it gets even worse? How about I remove the human and I remove the monkey, and I just take the paint and I put them all in the room with a canvas, and somehow I believe that it did it itself? Is that logical? Now, with that said... Think about how much complexity and design there is in that painting. Now, compare the complexity and design of that painting to the complexity and design of us as three-dimensional human beings. Aren't we more complex than that two-dimensional painting on the wall? 
Yet no one's going to believe that a painting could come together on its own. Yet we are more complex than the painting. One final analogy that I want to give you on this is, let's say I take an alarm clock, just your average alarm clock. I'll tell you what, let's make it, let's take a, a computer. I take a computer and I disassemble it bit by bit, part by part, every single wire, every bolt, everything. So now on the table, I have just a pile of a bunch of disassembled parts of a computer. And then I take all of those parts and I dump them in a giant jar. And I put a lid on that jar and I start shaking the jar. How many billions of years can I shake that jar before that computer is going to be reassembled? What if, it's a, what if it's a smartphone? How many years, billions of years, can I shake that jar until suddenly I hear, and it's a reassembled cell phone? It's never going to happen, right? Never. How much more complex is the human body and the human brain compared to a smartphone? And by the way, the atheist would have us believe that the jar actually started out empty. At least what I'm doing is I'm taking all the parts to the cell phone that are already made to fit each other and putting them in the jar, and we know they're never going to come together. The atheist says you've got to come up with the parts starting with an empty jar. So what I'd like to do is I want to examine for you the complexity of that smartphone compared to the complexity of a human being. So let's look at this logically for a moment. A human being has 10 fingers, 10 toes, a nose, a mouth, two eyes, each one with 120 million photoreceptors, two ears, each one with 24,000 hair cells that convert sound vibrations into electrical impulses. We have a body with over 30 trillion cells and 2 million sweat glands that automatically regulate temperature to within a fraction of a degree. We have a brain with over 100,000, or I'm sorry, 100 billion cells, and each one with over 50,000 neuron connections to other brain cells. We have a central nervous system, organs, blood flow, consciousness, a standard of morality, self-awareness, and a vocabulary with the necessary vocal cords to say, I'm done, you can get me out of this jar. Is it logical to believe that this level of complexity and design can come together somehow on its own from nothing when we can't even put together a cell phone in a jar when all the parts are already designed to fit each other and we know that'll never happen? Let's examine this mathematically, if we could. I don't know if there's any mathematicians in the room. But I want you to know how mathematically impossible it is for us to evolve, all right? For us to come into existence from nothing. The simplest protein molecule, the simplest protein molecule has over 400 linked amino acids that are in a very specific order. You have to have the right sequence of these 400 linked amino acids to produce even the simplest protein molecule. So I want you to see mathematically that it's impossible that 400 linked amino acids could form in just the right order. To do this, I want to simplify the puzzle for the atheist. And here's how we're going to do this. All right? Let's say instead of 400 linked amino acids, let's pretend it was only 100, because I want to try to make it easy for the atheist. So there's only 100 linked amino acids, we'll pretend, for the simplest protein molecule, but they have to be in the right sequence, the right order. So let me really simplify this now. Let's say I have 100 cards, well, playing cards, like a deck of cards, okay? There's 100 cards, but each one of them has numbers 1 through 100 on them. Numbers 1 through 100 and I'm shuffling these cards. What I have to do to get 100 linked amino acids is I have to shuffle them a whole bunch of times until coincidentally I happen to land upon the right sequence where, hey, it's a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, all the way up to 100. 
How many times do I have to shuffle that deck of cards before I can produce a perfect sequence of one to 100? If there's any mathematicians in the room, you might know this, okay? Let me, let me tell you how you can figure this out. The easiest way is doing something in mathematics called a factorial. Let me explain a factorial to you. Because I want you to see mathematically it's impossible for there to be no God. Okay? A factorial works like this. Instead of 100 cards, let's say I had three cards. Just a one, a two, and a three. What are my options? Every time I shuffle, what are my options? I could get a one, two, three. That'd be perfect. Okay? But I also might get three, two, one. That's no good. Can't make the amino acid, okay? Uh, I, I can't make the simplest protein molecule. I might get a two, three, one. Oh, that's no good. I make it a three, one, two. That's no good, okay? I need to get a one, two, three. So how many times do I have to shuffle that, those three cards until the laws of probability say I'm going to stumble upon one, two, three? There are actually six different variables. I could do one, two, three. I could do three, two, one. I can do three, one, two. I can do three, two. I, you know, there's six different options of this. The easiest way to do it is what's called a factorial. Take three times two times one, and that equals six. Three times two equals six. Six times one equals six. Three times two times one equals six. That tells me I have six different combination options to get one, two, three. So I have to shuffle that, those three cards three times. So for 100 cards, how many times do I have to shuffle it to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up to 100 in perfect order? Well, you do a factorial. You take 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 times 96 all the way down to one. And that will tell you how many times I have to shuffle that deck of cards to get one through 100 in the right sequence. Guess how many shuffles that is? It is 10 to the 158th power number of shuffles. 10 to the 158th power number of shuffles. Just to give you an idea, folks, that's a one with 158 zeros after it. To put this into perspective, there are not that many grains of sand on planet Earth. To put this into in more perspective, there are not that many atoms on planet earth to put that into more perspective there are not that many atoms in the open space of the milky way galaxy that's how big of a number one with 158 zeros after it is yet that's how many times you would have to shuffle a deck of cards to produce just a one through a 100 perfect sequence mathematically now you might say well yeah but the earth is 13.8 billion years old, so that's enough time to shuffle this deck of cards. No, it's not. You want to know why? Remember, 10 to the 158th power is how many times we have to shuffle the deck. Did you know that if I give the atheist 30 billion years instead of 13.8 billion? Let's be really generous. Let's give him 30 billion years. Do you know in 30 billion years... You know how many seconds there are in 30 billion years? Seconds? 10 to the 30th power. Number of seconds. 10 to the 30th, or I'm sorry, my bad, 10 to the 18th power, number of seconds. 10 to the 18th power, number of seconds in 30 billion years. Okay, divided by 10 to the 158th power, that leaves 10 to the 140th power. What that means is this. You would have to, every second... For 30 billion years, you would have to shuffle that deck of cards 10 to the 148th power number of times every second. That's a blur. <laughs> that many times every second for 30 billion years before the laws of probability say you would stumble upon a 1 through 100 proper sequence. The simplest protein molecule has 400 linked amino acids, and it's a 1 through 400 perfect sequence, and that's just the simplest protein molecule. That's not all of the other complex stuff I just told you about the human body. Does it really make mathematical sense to believe that somehow life just generated on its own, and then all this complexity and design developed? And then somehow we developed consciousness, self-awareness, 
the capacity for love, hate, jealousy, pride, self-sacrifice. And can I tell you on a side note, uh, there's still the issue of Jesus Christ. You still have to deal with the fact that here was a man documented and verified in history by eyewitnesses who rose from the dead and hung around for 40 days, seen by hundreds and hundreds of people and made paralyzed people walk and blind people see and rose other people from the dead. This actually happened in real life history. So it is just not logical to try to deny the existence of God. It's just not. Now, I, uh, I want to kind of wind this down with you with, uh, w- w- with a little bit of a talk about, uh, and I'm not going to go very long into this, okay, but a little bit of talk about science itself and the authority of God's word. One of the things I shared with the audience last night was my passion not just for apologetics but specifically for creation science. I really want you guys to know, okay, the Bible is true, Genesis is true, Darwinian evolution is false. When you examine the scientific evidence itself, when you examine the fossil record, when you examine radiometric dating and you see how it's really done, you go, wow, it's not possible that everything is millions and billions of years old. We have been conditioned to believe this. We've been conditioned because we've only been given bits and pieces of the evidence that make it look like things are billions of years old. But there's a whole mountain of evidence that is censored from the school history books, censored from the school science books. And my passion is getting this information out so that people are aware of it. I want them to know it's out there. I can guarantee you right now, I mentioned dinosaurs before. I'll bet you that nobody in here even knew that dinosaur bones have actually been carbon dated by evolutionary dating laboratories themselves. Anybody who understands science will say, Bob, that's not possible because carbon dating can't be done on anything that's over 100,000 years old and dinosaur bones are over 65 million years old. Yeah, I know carbon dating can't be done on anything over 100,000 years old because any evolutionist will tell you that if you carbon date something that's believed to be more than 100,000 years old, it can't have any more C14 left in it. There's no carbon-14 in it to measure because when things die, they lose carbon-14. And the rate that they lose it, it will run empty in 100,000 years. Any atheist will tell you that. But evolutionary scientists have, in fact, dated many, many, many dinosaur bones. And not once ever have they published their findings in any of of the mainstream media accounts. You want to know why? Because every single time dinosaur bones have been dated, they still have plenty of measurable carbon-14 left in them. That's not possible if they've been dead 65 million years. They would have lost all of their carbon-14 64.9 million years ago. But dinosaurs were created 6,000 years ago, and they still have plenty of measurable carbon-14 in them. Trust me, in my materials, I document the actual uh, radiometric dating laboratories like the University of Arizona Geophysics Laboratory and the National Academy of Sciences and others that have documented and verified, yes, this carbon-14 is in these. But we're not going to report this. And guess what percentage of dinosaur bones that have been carbon dated have plenty of carbon-14 in them? 100%. There's not one dinosaur bone ever that's been carbon dated that doesn't have plenty of measurable carbon-14 in it. Not one. Every single time they've carbon dated diamonds, coal, petrified wood, anything that's supposedly millions and millions of years old, it all still has plenty of measurable carbon-14 in them. Dr. Mary Schweitzer, one of the leading evolutionary paleontologists in the world, broke open a few years ago a Tyrannosaurus rex bone, believed to be 90 million years old. It still was soft and gooey inside, soft tissue, blood vessels, ligaments, everything else. 60 Minutes even did a report on this. The Associated Press reported on it. But then they just hurry up and let that story go away. Because creation scientists are like, "Uh, excuse me, soft tissue breaks down at the molecular level within just a few thousand years. I mean, there is so much evidence. I told the people last night, Marco Polo, we've all heard of Marco Polo. He wrote his, of the province named Carazon in 1295 AD. 
But chapter 40 is censored from every school history book. Want to know why? Look it up yourself. Chapter 40 is where he wrote in detail the Tyrannosaurus Rex that he saw. Right now, you can go around the world and there are tourist attractions of cave drawings of dinosaurs from 1,000, 2,000 years ago. Artwork, mosaics, drawings, paintings, descriptions. Herodotus, the Greek historian, wrote about dinosaurs. Pliny the Elder wrote about dinosaurs, specifically uh, 30-foot-long dinosaurs, I mean, describing them in detail, large enough to swallow a man whole. I mean, this stuff is all throughout history, and the fossils themselves are not millions and billions of years old. They're only a few thousand years old at best. Actually, it doesn't take that long for things to fossilize. It only takes a matter of weeks. When you find a bone in the ground and you're just like, oh, well, hey, this thing must be millions of years old, right? No. No. It doesn't take that long. I document the actual evolutionary scientists who say, yeah, it only takes a few weeks for things to fossilize. But most of us have been conditioned to believe it takes a long time. So when you look at a fossilized bone, you think that must be millions of years old. That can't be just a couple hundred years old. But did you know, in archaeology, it's been discovered all over the world, and this is public information, modern artifacts that have been completely fossilized. They're on display right now in creation science museums around the world, but the media will never report on them. A bowler's hat. Solid stone, completely fossilized. A derby hat, solid stone, completely fossilized. Sausage links, bags of flour. There's a skeletal foot inside of a cowboy boot, solid stone, completely fossilized. I have to... Oh, I say I'm out of time, but you know what? I've got to tell you this quick story. I think you'll appreciate this story, and I'll kind of close it down with this. I was going to a speaking engagement, and I got into town a little bit early. This is in Livonia, Michigan. And I saw this strip mall, and so I went to this, this shopping center, the strip mall, and there was a science store. And so I went in the science store. I was just killing time. And I noticed on the shelf they were selling this bone, probably about this long, and they were selling it for 50 bucks. And the sign said, 40-million-year-old bone. So I asked the gal working behind the counter, I said, how do I know this is 40 million years old? How do I know it's not just maybe a couple hundred years old? And she said, well, would you like to talk to the owner? And I said, well, who's the owner? She said, he's a retired scientist. And I said, oh, please bring him out. So he comes out. Can I help you, sir? I said, yeah. I've been looking everywhere for a 40 million year old bone. I see you've got one, okay? How do I know this is 40 million years old? How do I know it's not maybe just a couple hundred years old? And he said, well, sir, pick up the bone. So I picked it up. And he said, examine it. And I said, okay, I'm examining it. He says, you can see that this is stone. And I said, yes, I can see that. And uh, I said, well, let me make sure I understand the permineralization process and how fossilization works. So I explained it to him. And I said, do I have that right? And he said, yes. And by now his employees are gathering around watching us. And I said, okay, how do I know that didn't happen with this bone just a couple hundred years ago? He said, well, because it takes millions of years for fossils to form. I said, really? Are you aware of the fact that discovered in archaeology are all kinds of modern artifacts that are solid stone completely fossilized? And he said, yes, I'm aware of those, but those aren't really fossils. I said, they're not. And he said, no. And I said, okay, so hold on. Let's make sure we got this right. And it's funny because his employees are just sitting there watching us. So I said, so let's, and this poor guy, because he doesn't know I debate evolutionists for a living. So uh, I said, so let's say I take this bone and I put it here on the counter. And let's say I take, oh, that derby hat in New Zealand and I put it here. And we do a chemical analysis on both of these. Will the mineral content of each one be the same? And he said, well, Yes. I said, okay, in other words, they will be made out of the very same rock material. Is that right? And he said, well, yes. I said, then, why do you say that the bone is, 40, that, that the bone is a fossil and the hat is not? And I kid you not, his answer was, because the bone is 40 million years old and the hat is clearly not. That was his answer. And I just stared at him. And we didn't say anything. 
And then he said, okay, well, when you make me word it that way, it makes my argument sound silly. And I said, hey, you're the scientist. I'm just a customer. <laughs> okay. So I shook his hand and I left. All right. But I, I just, I want you to understand you have been conditioned to look at things a certain way. You need to take a squeegee to all of that and start over and say, wow, I'm looking at the fossils. I'm looking at the geologic strata. I'm looking at the universe. I'm looking at it through a different lens. And you know what that lens needs to be? The word of God, what scripture says. God's word is true. And the scientific evidence backs this up. You know what? I completely forgot to mention this. I better mention it real quick, okay? Um, when we leave, out there in the lobby, you're going to see a couple of tables. These are the tables that have my products. They have my materials on them, okay? One table is a top ten proofs table. The other table is the anchoring your faith table. Because you folks aren't familiar with my show, many of you, at least the ones that weren't here last night, don't know what top ten proofs are. So I need to take a couple of minutes and explain it to you very quickly. That way... I don't want everybody to come out there and ask, and we have to explain it one at a time to everybody. That takes too long. So here's what they are. Top 10 proofs are 14 different topics. You have these little cards. They're on the light blue side. On the light blue side of the card are 14 different topics. These are all uh, audio CDs. They're recorded by me. What you have to do if you don't have a CD player, get one or load it into your computer, and then you can transfer it to your device if you need to, okay? But these are audio CDs. And what I've done is I've taken these 14 different topics and I did about 25 years of research and documented and verified all of the censored factual evidence, like some of the stuff I just shared with you now, that's documented and verified to prove each one of these things are really true. So one of them is the top 10 proofs, evolution is scientifically impossible. And it goes through the 10 best arguments to prove the biblical creation is true and scientific evidence proves Darwinian evolution is false. And one of them is the top 10 proofs for a young earth. And it documents the 10 best arguments to prove that the earth and the universe cannot be billions of years old. It's impossible scientifically. One of them, by the way, is top 10 proofs for God's existence. This morning I shared with you less than half of what's in that CD. Okay? But there's a whole bunch of different topics in there. One, the top 10 proofs the Bible is true. One, the top 10 proofs Christianity is the only true religion. One, the top 10 proofs for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have other ones in there you'll see that deal with things like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, homosexuality, abortion, ghosts, UFOs, and the paranormal. I mean, just all kinds of stuff that's in there. Uh, this is what they look like, okay? Most of them are two-disc sets. And they're 20 bucks a piece. That's $20 US. I don't know what works out to Canadian, but it's $20 US, okay? Um, some of the topics are single disc, and those are 15 bucks, but most of them are double disc and 20 bucks. There are 14 of them total in the series. The most popular thing we sell is the complete series because if you get the whole thing, we dramatically lower the price. If you buy these all individually, all 14 topics add up to $250 US. However, if you get the whole series, we lower that $250 down to $169 US. And we put it in a nice display case so you can put them on your shelf and you've got the whole thing there. What I want you to do is listen to them. Listen to them because you're going to be amazed the information you learn. You're going to be like, I did not know that. I didn't know that. And what happens is you become the answer person in your family. So when people start asking tough questions, well, how do you explain this? How do you explain that? I want you to be able to go, you know what? Six months ago, I had no idea. But now, rattle off the answer. I want you to become a walking encyclopedia with your family and your friends to be able to defend the faith uh, as Christians, all right? So that's the top 10 proof side. Yes, we take credit cards. Uh, credit cards will just charge uh, the U.S. rate is what it'll be. So whatever that works out to Canadian. Uh, and we take checks and we also take uh, cash. We take loonies and toonies and whatever you guys call them, okay? So all of those are fine. Now, the other side of this, the dark blue side, this is the Anchoring Your Faith series, that's on the second table, the table to the right. There's only eight of these topics, not 14. 
Those eight topics deal with the things in life that tend to chip away at our faith and beat us up and how we handle those issues logically, intellectually, but also biblically. So you can strengthen your faith during those times it seems like God doesn't make sense. So this series, same prices, but since there's less of them, these all add up to $150, but we discount that $150 down to $99 U.S. So you can get the whole Strengthening Your Faith series for $99 U.S., the whole Top 10 Proofs Apologetics series for $169 U.S., and if you get the whole shebang, everything, $169 plus $99, it comes to $268, okay? And that includes everything that's out there. That's what we have. I would encourage you, come on out and get them. You can get them individually if you want to, but if you can afford to get the whole thing, get the whole thing because the price goes down so much, okay? Just listen to them if you get them, that's all. I want us to be developed so that we can answer tough questions as skeptics have, and that's my passion, that's my goal, okay? So I just want to say how much I appreciate all of you folks having me out. It's been such an honor to be here last night and today as well and to share with you not only my faith, but my desire to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. And don't forget this, all right? If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can accept him, okay? You can settle the matter of eternity. Give your life to the Lord because there is no other name by which we can be saved except through Jesus Christ. Not by being a good enough person, not by having some form of spirituality, only by being washed clean of our sins through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So if you have not given your life to the Lord, I hope you will seriously consider that, okay? Anyway, I thank you all so much for having me. I understand we're going to have a little bit of singing, so I'm looking forward to that as well. But uh, thanks so much.